with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the day after his close shave at Disneyland, Terry, along with half of Hollywood, was at the opening party for Banksy's show. It was an even bigger star, however, who provoked the real sensation. Banksy had camouflaged his rented elephant with 12 litres of children's face paint in an apparent statement about how easy it is to ignore the things right in front of us. But the American news media could only see what was right in front of them and came flocking to report on the elephant in the room. I'm Angie Crouch. Coming up at 5.30, animal rights activists are outraged over an art exhibit involving a live painted There's elephant. There's an elephant in the room, a problem that we never talk about since this small white card given to visitors. It's better. Um, you already got your interview, so can you... The magical combination of controversy, celebrity, and the painted elephant turned the show into an event. We had the sort of attendance that you get for a decent show at the Museum of Modern Art or something, only over three days and in Skid Row. Um, so I think a lot of the people in the art world were a little bit confused as to how that would happen, you know? As were we, to be honest. Barely Legal marked the point at which street art was forced into the spotlight, attracting sudden interest from the art establishment. In the months that followed, Prices for work by leading street artists rocketed, with collectors rushing to get in on this exciting new market. Lot number 33A, the Banksy, the vandalized phone box. And I'll start here at $100,000, $100,000, $110,000, $120,000, $130,000, $140,000. Street art had become a white hot commodity. Now, no serious contemporary art collection would be complete. Without a Banksy. Those little bunnies are Warhols. That's a Lichtenstein. And then that's Keith Haring, who I'm not a fan of. The Andy Warhol Mao is the first thing I ever bought. I was like 20 years old and I put it on layaway and it's a you know, the smaller Mao. And it's beautiful. I mean it's beautiful, but it's in a it's in the closet. Oh, yeah, here's the bank here's a big Banksy. That one's from the show in LA. I saw Banksy and I thought he was a genius. And every person I told about it bought something, like people who have Picassos and, you know, Mondrians and Paul Clay and God, I don't even know who else. They have, I mean, serious collections. So then these famous auction houses, all of a sudden they were selling street art and everything was going a bit crazy and suddenly it all become about the money, but it never was about the money. So I said to Terry, right, you have the footage, you can tell the real story of what this art is about. It's not about the hype, it's not about the money, now is the time. You need to get your film out. Banksy had put Terry well and truly on the spot. He now had to devise a way to transform thousands of hours of unwatched tapes into the epic documentary he had been promising everyone for so long. So we start working on uh, the back of my house, doing some editing. It was like kind of a vision that I saw. Here. And the way that I made it, I really did it. Here, which is there. Kind of the way, you know, like when you have a bucket and you have a lot of numbers and you said, you look and one and you open and you said, this is the number 12. This is the way that I made it, kind of way. I just took couple tape here, couple tape here, couple tape here, couple tape here. Take a little piece of here, little piece of there, little piece of there. And this is the way that I made it. Okay, now, let's go back a little bit yeah. and do a review because... I'm like what I say, I'm playing chess. I don't know how to play chess, but life is a chess game for me. The following spring, Terry returned to England. I'm gonna do a flip. 
all his years of filming and thousands of hours of material had been crafted into a 90-minute film with the intriguing title, Life Remote Control. He called up and he came to London because he said he nearly finished the film and uh, he came round my house and put the DVD on and he said, this is it, it's nearly finished. <laughs> that maybe Terry wasn't actually a filmmaker and he was maybe just someone with mental problems who happened to have a camera. It just seemed to go on and on. It was an hour and a half of unwatchable nightmare trailers, essentially like somebody with a short attention span with a remote control flicking through a cable box of 900 channels. Peace to the whole world. You have to keep an eye on the big picture. I told him I'd never seen anything like it, and I wasn't lying about that. Yeah, I was faced with that terrible thing when somebody shows you their work and everything about it is shit, so you don't really know where to start. He's like, uh, it's good, you know? It's good, you know, it's good. I mean, the thing is that Terry had all this amazing footage of all this stuff that, you know, in this tiny world of street art was kind of important, and it was never going to happen again. So it felt right to at least make something that you could actually watch about it. So I thought, you know, maybe I could have a go. I mean, I don't know how to make a film, but obviously that hadn't stopped Terry, but I needed him out of the way in order to do it. So I said, why don't you go and put up some more of your posters and uh, make some art? You know, have a little show, invite a few people, get some bottles of wine, and uh, off he went back to Los Angeles and he left me with the tapes. Terry returned home to Los Angeles full of enthusiasm for his unexpected new assignment. Banksy had just given him what he considered to be a direct order, to put down his camera and become a street artist himself. I think he, he put me into street art because I like what he did. Me as respecting him, you know, having him to push you to do street art, I just went and like, it, it was not even a push, it was like an enjoyment to get pushed, you know. So now, using the formula he had seen work so well for the world's biggest street artists, Terry set about creating his own alter ego and iconic visual style. I came up with the idea that the whole movement of art is all about brainwashing. Obey is about brainwashing. Banksy is about brainwashing. So. I use MBW, and I am Mr. Brainwash. 